Hey there, and welcome to The Cozy Corner, a podcast about all things cozy. Join us as we dive into the world of film and TV, a little true crime and spooky time, food reviews, and talk to some special guests too. So get cozy, grab some snacks, and settle in, because we're about to begin. Hello listeners, Emily here. Today I'm going to be flying solo as Abby isn't feeling too well, but she's doing okay and hopefully she's going to be right back soon and we can enjoy some more video episodes and vlogcast episodes when she comes back. We've got lots planned, we're very excited. Um, We've also got some interviews planned with some different people, so if you're interested in finding out about you know, some local industries, shall we say, as well as different people who have worked in the TV and film industry and a few different people who have got really interesting stories about themselves and how they grew up and their lives, basically, then stick around um, because we've got those coming in the next few weeks. But for today's episode, we're going to be focusing on a review, a very special review to me, because this is going to be focusing on Avatar The Last Airbender. Now, I used to watch this show as a kid. I grew up on it. I was so excited to come home from school, grab a snack, settle in and just watch this amazing animation creation. It... I loved it. It was just, it encapsulated so many different things, so many different themes, and yet it was funny, it was, you could tell the people who worked on it were passionate. Even from a young age, I like I felt the passion transpire from screen to me consuming it. Um, but yeah, I, I just really, really enjoyed this as a child. And obviously... There was an attempt to make this as a live action previously. And that did not go as planned. Definitely did not. Um, The CGI was horrendous and the casting was absolute rubbish. It was. I mean, this Avatar The Last Airbender, if you don't know what it is, I'll do a quick little job of summing it up for you. So this guy, Ang. Um, it's all kind of set in Asian countries, so obviously you need Asian casting, which is where the first live action went wrong. They casted all white people, and then the only Asian people were the bad guys. Hmm, what are you trying to say there? You know, not a great message. But anyway, um, this guy, Ang, he's found in an iceberg. Turns out he is what is known as the Avatar, who in this world can master all four elements. You've got water, earth, fire, and air. And many people are what is known as benders, which is a funny little term, but that means someone who can manipulate a certain element. So you can be a water bender or a fire bender, earth bender, air bender. Um, But the avatar is the only known person who can master all four elements. And they maintain peace in all four nations and in the spirit world because they're infused with spirit magic. So, yeah, this guy, Ang, he's been missing for like a hundred years. He's been stuck in his iceberg. And um, there's been a hundred year war going on. He kind of feels responsible for it because he was supposed to be around, you know, to stop that from happening. So you can understand why he feels guilty, but at the same time, you're one person. You know, you can't, you can't stop everything. But yeah, um, he's also 12. So there's that. Like, you know, stop it, you're 12 year old. You're, you're 12. Like, the whole world does not rest on your shoulders. You are 12. <laughs> but yeah, the show focuses a lot on very heavy themes of war and sexism as well. Feminism. Um, struggles within this war-torn world, many different conflicts, as well as identity issues and disability representation. There's so much that goes on in this show. And that's even before we get to the new live action. That That's just in an animated show for children. And honestly, 
I thought it was incredible. For me growing up watching that, I felt like I learned so many life lessons from it. It was really impactful. And it, it was just something that made it such an impact that when it came to live action being made again, another attempt, I was worried. I thought, no, they're not going to do it justice because it was already perfect. If it's not broke, don't fix it. It's already perfect. But at the same time, I would like to see a live action version. If it's done correctly, I just think it's very difficult to to actually do that correctly. Not just because it's a very long TV series. I mean, it's about three seasons. Uh, No, sorry. Was it? Hang on. Oh my God. Yeah, three. Yeah, three. Because they wanted to do a fourth, but the it ended up cancelling. Um, they were going to do they in the animation series. They used to call it book one, book two, book three because it's based on books um, and comics. But um, obviously, we know <laughs> these as like series one, series two, series three. But they call it book one, book two, book three. So yeah, there's three altogether. They did aim to do a fourth, but that didn't end up happening. And then we later got Legend of Korra as a spin-off as well, which kind of covered what they originally wanted to, but in a different way. Um, So instead of getting a fourth season, they managed to do a spin-off, which was something. But yeah, I was a bit worried about it becoming a live action. And I I did think maybe this won't translate well because... In animation, you've got a bit more freedom with how you can do kind of CGI things. Like, you can create things in animation that you cannot create using computer-generated images and effects, you know, practical effects. Some things are just not doable. So, I, I was concerned. But... Before we get into my actual review of the live action, I think we need to do a cosy check because we haven't really been keeping up with that. I think on our first ever episode, we did a cosy check and we wanted to keep it a regular thing, but that kind of went out the window. So you know what? I'm bringing it back. Let's do a cosy check. Right. Am I cosy? I've got a jumper on. Don't know, well, cardigan. Don't know if you can hear it. With the mic, is picking it up. It's very soft. It's I like to call it my snazzy cardigan because it's kind of like Aztec print. It's colourful. It's bold, but it's also really nice, warm and cosy, and it felt fitting for an Avatar episode because this feels like something that one of the tribes would wear, like maybe like the Earth Earth Kingdom, like you know something like that. Like it felt. Like it fit in with that universe. I've also got a really cosy teddy bear blanket from Dunelm. Get yourselves one because it's so comfortable. This is not sponsored by Dunelm. Just a disclaimer. I mean, hit me up, Dunelm. Because I have talked about these blankets before. But they're so soft. The teddy bear blankets. And oh, I love them. I've bought four. Four. That's uh, and with my own money. That's how good they are. They're so cosy. And you know me, I'm all about cosy. This is literally called the cosy corner. We're all about cosy. Um, And speaking of the cosy corner, I am actually in the cosy corner. And I'm sitting in my favourite spot on the couch with lots of cushions. And it's raining outside. I don't know whether the mic can pick it up, but it actually sounds as if like there's a storm going on. There hasn't been one predicted, but it feels like there is currently a storm battering the cosy corner at the moment. So if the mic picks that up, my apologies, but hey, it adds to the ambience. Um, And I also have a little drink with me. Um, I'm just going to open that, so headphone users, beware, there's some ASMR coming up. Hope that wasn't too loud. Um, and you know what? We're going to do a new segment. What drink am I drinking? Can you guess from the sound alone? Because 
I don't think I'd be able to, but let's find out. Um, I do like to have a nice little fizzy drink now and again, especially when recording the pod. Puts me in a little cosy mood. I had a hot chocolate earlier on while I was watching some episodes of the new Dead Hot, which, oh, we're definitely doing a review on that. I cannot wait. Oh my goodness, so good. But anyway, um, got a lot to dive into with that. That's for another episode shortly. Um, So yeah, I am fully in a cosy mood. I think I can check everything off there for the cosy check. So, shall we get into it? So for my review, disclaimer, I might miss some stuff. I'm not perfect, but that's okay. We're not here to be perfect. We're here to listen to what I think about this show that I used to watch as a kid and now watch as an adult. And you chose to listen to this, so this is your doing, okay? (laughs) So I'm not perfect, I might miss some stuff, but I wrote down everything that I can think of. I'm gonna go through what the biggest differences were between the cartoon, the animation, and the live action, what I think they did right and what I think they did wrong and then I'll give an overall opinion near the end. So settle in because we're about to get into this and if you haven't then go get yourselves a nice little snack, something like a nice little little treat, something that's going to make you happy and going to bring you to a nice cosy place. Maybe make yourself a hot chocolate, maybe a cup of coffee with a biscuit, or a nice little cup of tea, or as Ira would say, why not have yourself a nice little jasmine tea? Now, to be fair, I probably should have thought of doing that for this episode, but I didn't, and I don't want to go make it now, but I do promise you all, straight after this episode, I'm going to have myself a warming cup of jasmine tea instead of you know starting a war looking at you Zuka. um so yeah i'm gonna do that later definitely and have myself in a nice little cozy mood um i i do wish i had one right now but it's it's in the kitchen it's too far away and i'm cozy i don't want to ruin the coziness if i get up now i will ruin the coziness and I can't be ruining those vibes. So we're all just going to imagine that I've got a warming cup of jasmine tea. But if you have that at home yourselves, go get some. Or a green tea. Or, oh, a nice green tea with honey. That's nice. That's lovely. I like to put a little bit of honey in my in my jasmine tea. Um, Enough about tea. I do like tea. But enough about tea. Instead, I've got a little fizzy drink that's going to keep me awake because I am tired. I am tired today and this little drink has caffeine in. That's a hint for whoever's playing along, guessing the drink. It has a bit of caffeine in, but not a lot. Anyway, so the biggest differences throughout the live action compared to the original um, are as follows. So the beginning, we actually start off in the Fire Nation, which is very different because in the original... We start off with Katara and Sokka. They're on the little boat in the Southern Water Tribe. They're cold and they're they're looking for some food. Sokka's trying to catch a fish. So we start off with them and then Sokka is a bit sexist and he he tells like Katara like to stop with her water bending and all that and she's no good at it. Um and she gets a bit angry at him. And her anger leads to her being able to waterbend a little bit more. Because we do learn throughout that waterbending and any kind of bending can often be expressed better with emotion. So that's like a little hint of, of what's to come because it does foreshadow. So in the original we see that her being angry triggers the waterbending which, which then makes the iceberg erupt sort of thing and then we find Ang, but no no doesn't happen like that instead we start off with the fire nation which actually i'm not all that mad about i feel like in the original 
we didn't see them until the second season or book two we didn't get that introduction and it made them a lot less human because the only time we would see them would be when they're attacking or when they're planning on attacking or when they're firebending like we never saw any anything else really we didn't get an earlier interaction we didn't get an explanation of how the whole air nomad genocide came to be and in the live action that was right off the bat it went straight into the action it showed us who the fire nation are what they want and how ruthless they are to get it and i feel like maybe we needed that especially for newer fans people who haven't seen the original and who are just now joining the fandom hello and welcome we love you and you're welcome to be here but you should go back and watch the animation because it's well worth it and honestly there's so much in there that isn't included in in the live action so like go check that out but anyway um i i do kind of agree with this new introduction of the fire nation much much earlier and i enjoyed seeing like susan and learning a bit more about how they planned around the comet and the air nomads and and all that and then another difference is that in the animation we only heard about the murder of all those air nomads through Ang discovering their bodies like after a hundred years what was left of their bodies all the bones and we saw the fire nation helmet and you know you put two and two together and you realize the fire nation did this i actually liked that better i thought that leaving it to the imagination and seeing it through Ang's perspective added more emotion to it because we felt like we were Ang. We've missed out on that. We weren't there to see it. So I liked it better in the original for that, that part. But it was still very interesting to actually see this play out. Because we didn't get to see it. So although I wasn't a fan of that part. It, you know, I'm not all too mad about it. It was still alright. We did get to see what happened with Monk Gyatso. Oh, Monk Gyatso. So, 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 so sad. We love him. Oh, so sad. Um, spoiler alert. <laughs> he dies. If so, you know, if you haven't uh, seen it, why are you listening to this? But yeah, that's very, very sad. Because obviously he's more like a father figure to Aang. And he's killed and it's just oh the only thing that i really agreed with within this whole scene of the genocide of the air nomads was that we got to see more of ang and monkey Atso. we got to see them together more in the air temple and see ang as a child more like an actual child you know just playing with his mates and having some like quality time with monkey Atso and being able to just be a kid relax and then he learns that he's the avatar and it scares him and then he asked he, he just decides well i'm gonna go out for a bit on appa which is a little bit different again because in the original he decides to actually run away because he doesn't want to be sent to the other air temple which i think was the eastern air temple I think so he didn't want to be sent away so because of that he ran away and that's why he he was you know he felt so guilty about then getting trapped in the ice but in this he doesn't run away he just goes out for some air with Appa because that always makes him feel better and then gets trapped in this wave and then goes in the avatar state accidentally freezes and is stuck there for a hundred years leaving everyone to die which again, I can understand his guilt, but in the original, he had more of a reason to feel guilty because it was actually a choice, whereas this wasn't. So that 
difference. I would have preferred it if they would have kept it as it was Aang's choice to run away. Because it adds another layer. You know, he, he's more humanised then. He made a mistake. He made a choice and it was the wrong choice. But maybe, maybe it was the right one. Because, let's be honest, there's no way Aang would have survived if he would have been left behind with the air nomads. If he would have stayed there. He would have been wiped out, just like the rest of them, because he hadn't learned the, all the four elements at that point. He was going to be sent off to learn them. So there's no way he could have survived, really. So it seems like it all happened for a reason, as devastating as it was. Um, So in the live action, like the Air Nomads... We learn that they're at the Southern Temple. A lot of them come from different temples to the Southern Temple because of a festival that brings them all together in celebration. And Sozan realises that it's the perfect time to strike. And in the animated series, Fire Lord Sozan took advantage of the comet, um, which would later be called Sozan's Comet in his honour. And he decided to launch an attack on the Southern Air Temple but obviously, Ang, he escapes. Well, he, he doesn't escape because he doesn't know that's going to happen. But he goes out on upper and gets trapped in the ice. And then that all happens. Now, in both the animation and the live action, it's not specified the length of time between those two things. When does the genocide happen? When does Ang get trapped in the ice? Is it at the same time? Or is it Ang gets trapped in the ice? And then a few weeks later, all of the Air Nomads are massacred. It's not entirely said. You know, it, it's not confirmed. But it seems to be that either it's at the same time or they're very close to each other. And then how we find Ang is not exactly how it happens in the original. And I would have liked them to keep it as as close to the original as they could have for this bit because I appreciated Katara's anger in that moment and how it foreshadows her use of emotion when it comes to bending. And of course, we get to learn in the original that Sokka is a bit sexist. I don't think he means to be on purpose. I think he's brought up that way with that belief because in the water tribe, the men were the warriors, were the women, were the healers. And that's the same in the northern water tribe as well. So he was brought up with that belief and that he had to always be the one to protect his people, especially after when he was a young child, his dad had to go away to war to fight the Fire Nation to protect his people. And he was left behind as a small child and told to protect the village. So he's always had that sense of protecting the village, being responsible and having to be that warrior when there was no one else really because all of the men left. There was only children and women left. Everyone else went to go fight the Fire Nation. So I think we can forgive Sokka's sexism in the series because of how he was brought up and the perspective that he had. And in the animation, he does later go on to realise that his sexism, sexism is wrong. But we'll get to that later. In the, in the live action, though, unfortunately, they completely take away Sokka's sexism. And I don't agree with that. Let him be sexist. Because that is one thing that I think in soccer particular is an incredible character growth arc. He goes on to realise how wrong he is and he becomes a better person for it. But the whole reason why we've come across Ang is because soccer is a bit sexist and is horrible to his sister. She gets mad and then boom, this ice bag just comes up because of Katara accidentally waterbending. And then we have this mystery of who is the boy in the ice? What's going on? And 
I feel like that was a much better introduction to Aang. Instead, in the live action, they kind of just come across an iceberg that's already there. And they're like, oh, I think someone's inside. And then they go up to it and then they're like, yeah, someone's inside. And it's just, it felt a bit flat, you know. It didn't feel as natural. Um, And you could tell they reframed that because they wanted to take out Sokka's sexism. Because then later on as well, they take out another part of Sokka's sexism. Which we can get to right now. So the Kyoshi warriors, they are some warriors that um, Aang, Sokka and Katara come across when they go to Kyoshi Island. And in the original, it was a phenomenal intro to the, to the Kyoshi warriors. I loved it. Um, they ambush the gang. They completely like tie them up. Like <laughs> They just tackle them to the ground and then Sokka's response is whoa hang on where's all the men that ambushed us because he can't possibly conceive that women could do this so oh did I mention the Kyoshi warriors are all women they wear face paint and they have themselves look in the image as a previous avatar called Kyoshi Um, because there's multiple avatars like over past lives so when Aang dies, there'll be another avatar, if that makes sense. I'm just giving a brief explanation in case people don't aren't really familiar with it. Um, but anyway, so these Kyoshi warriors, love them, badass women, here for it. They're honestly like some of my favourite characters. Suki is the ultimate. She is the greatest of all times. I love her. Um, no wonder Sokka is taken with her when he sees her. Um, yeah, she's amazing. So Sokka instantly is sexist. He's like, you couldn't have possibly done all this. And they were like, well, no, there's no men here. Like, it was us. We took you down. And he just could not believe it. And we go on to, once they untie them and realise, oh, you're the avatar and, like, you're on our side. It's okay. Um, Later on in the original, Sokka tries to like show off his own warrior skills but completely gets like beat up and his arse is handed to him by Suki and it's from that that he slowly realises that actually his ideology of women can't be warriors is incorrect and that actually women can And that these Kyoshi warriors are actually incredibly skilled. They know what they're doing. And they can take down anyone. And he realises in that moment. I need to put my sexism aside. And I need to start learning how to fight like a Kyoshi warrior. Or we're not going to make it out alive. Because I am nowhere near as trained as they are. So he asks them. Will you teach me? And Suki, Suki, you know, she's like. Oh, you want to learn from me? Oh, okay. So she obliges, but she does say to him, you can only learn to be a Kyoshi warrior if you do it properly. And that means wearing the costume. Now the costume is face paint looking like Kyoshi the Avatar, who always did a face paint like a white face, red eyeshadow. I think there's a little bit of green in there, maybe some yellow. And it's, it's very striking. If you Google... Kyoshi warriors you'll see what I mean it's very striking and it's also a dress that kind of has some armor elements to it and their main weapon of choice apart from their hands is a fan because Kyoshi herself would often use a fan to amplify her bending and it just kind of looks cool as well so yeah Sokka in the original trained as a Kyoshi warrior in the whole garb and then the next minute Zuko attacks and mistakes him for being a girl and you know what they didn't include that in in the live action they didn't include it why 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 you missed out there first of all this was some epic and important character growth for Sokka we went from disliking Sokka 
to realising that he's just a normal person who can be right and wrong and make mistakes and he can change. And that's important. It shows that no, no one's perfect and people can change their ideology. I just think that that was a missed opportunity to showcase that in live action. Plus, not going to lie, I really wanted to see a live action soccer dressed as a Kyoshi warrior. I was looking forward to it. I couldn't wait for that moment of soccer being like, wait, where are all these men who ambushed us? And Suki just being like, there's no men, it was us. Like, we did this to you. But no, we didn't get that moment. So I am very disappointed in that. Because it was just, it was a big moment. It was important. And it really stood out. So they missed the mark on Sokka's warrior arc. And on his character growth from being a sexist arsehole. To being someone who actually really respects and appreciates women. And is a feminist himself. So, Netflix, you missed the mark on that. But moving on. Um, a Moshu. Now, a Moshu Part 1 combined some elements of Jet's story with the mechanist and his son. And we also get to see Zuko and Iroh in, in Omoshu, which was different to what actually happened in the original. Now, I've got to say, some things, you know, so far I haven't been, like, too happy with, but... I really did not mind the combination of these stories. In the original, there are a lot of different stories that we see that the gang go off on and they have little adventures. <laughs> like, they go off and just have some fun or then they go and save a town from some spirit animal or then they go off somewhere else and save a town from pollution and then, you know, they go to all these different places and have little adventures. At one point they go into a swamp that is alive. It's crazy. It's fun. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's a romp. It's a great time. But because of time... Pardon me. Sorry, I bet because I've been drinking a fizzy drink. I hope the mic did not like fully pick that up. <laughs> if it did, I apologise. Um, but yeah, I feel like they did a good job of combining these. Because it does work well. It's the only thing I didn't like is that they could have done a better job with Jet's storyline. But honestly, I'm not too mad because they were able to make it work. We were able to see a Moshu. Um, I mean, the visuals are amazing. They've done a great job of recreating um, the four nations. Well, we haven't seen all four, to be fair, so... We can't say that, but the nations that we've seen so far, they've done a good job of recreating them. And I've really enjoyed being able to see Omoshu brought to life properly. So I I did like that. And um, Jet's story, that was kind of on one of their little adventures. Um, they were in like a forest sort of thing. And it was different to this live action portrayal but to be fair what they've done is they selected the most important elements took it out combined it with the mechanist and his son is it mechanist or mechanist Me mechanist mechanist i don't know the mechanist the mechanist i'm gonna go with mechanist okay so the mechanist and his son who is by the way disabled but technically even though he's not a bender he does fly because he's like an inventor the mechanist so he made his son like a makeshift airbender if that makes sense like he was able to allow him to airbend even though his son can't walk and he's in, in a wheelchair he can fly because of their practicality and and inventions and i oh the casting for for that um, role, I really enjoyed The Mechanist. I feel like they were spot on there. Um, and we get to see Zuko and Iroh in Omoshu, which 
we didn't get to see but i felt like it did fit in well it it went with it like it matched the storyline and it kind of combined well with the others i do wish we got to explore jet's story more and actually see how it played out in the original because that was very different we didn't see him in omoshu we saw him i believe it was on the outskirts or it could have actually been by a different town i'm not 100 percent sure but we've seen them somewhere else and we kind of got to understand him and his crew a lot more, which I liked because it offered, you know, a lot more detail. And we also got to see that they had something planned, which was to completely wipe out um, a Fire Nation colony, even though that meant wiping out innocent people. And in the live action it kind of did the same thing but just not entirely like it wasn't to do with a flood which is what he had planned he was going to blow up a dam to flood this fire nation town well it was a town that had been taken over by fire nation so earthbenders that were in there i think it was earthbenders um would have been murdered but to jet that was just collateral damage that was fine because it meant being able to take out the firebenders so he's quite an extremist we do get to see you know many different sides within both the animation and and the live action we do get to see different sides of things which i really find interesting i think it's good to show that but also it's good to see that people can do extreme good but then there's extreme bad and then there's people who are in the middle, kind of like Ang. So yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, Amoshu Part Two. So we get to see Boomy, um, and the secret tunnel. Secret tunnel, secret tunnel, through the darkness. No, not through the darkness. What was it? Through something. Hang on, I'm just gonna Google the li- Google the. Li- I cannot speak. Google the lyrics. There we go. Because I need to know this. Through the mountain. That makes more sense considering it's about a mountain. Yeah. Great job, Emily. Um, That song is iconic. And if you've only heard the live action version, you need to watch on YouTube the original version because it's amazing and they do more songs throughout that episode um like a few different ones and i just think it's so much fun they are such underrated characters i think they're just called like the minstrels or something like i don't think they're given proper names but yeah the live action really encapsulated um (laughs) those characters because we know they're supposed to be like a stereotype of hippies who are like high and and just really chill and have like an alternative lifestyle to follow the rules and just do their own thing and it definitely captured that but i loved how they actually included the song i was worried they weren't gonna include it and when they did include that little snippet of it i sang along and i do apologize for my singing i'm not a singer but I'm going to give you another little rendition. Secret tunnel, secret tunnel, through the mountain. Secret, 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 secret tunnel. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I loved the whole secret tunnel thing. But it shouldn't have been so- um, Sokka and Katara in there. It should have been Katara and Ang. Because it needs to foreshadow their future relationship. Because they're in a tunnel that is like the lover's tunnel. Like this is like a secret tunnel designed for two lovers. What was the beginning of the song? Two lovers forbidden from one another. Two lovers forbidden from one another. Um, Something like that. People are divided by war or something like that. Um, but I love how they adapted that whole myth on screen. It was brilliant the way they did it, like the visuals. 
thought that was brilliant. But also, instead of making them being a male and a female, they changed it to be a lesbian relationship. And I was here for it. Yes. So how Amoshu came to be was two women, one called, I think it was Oma, and then one called Shu, and then together it becomes Amoshu. Um, and they built, it was two towns who were rivals, that you couldn't be together, so then they built a secret tunnel to be together, um, and die, as one of the lines was that the guy forgot. But yeah, um, <laughs> so... Yeah, apparently in the tunnel to be able to guide their way because they had to build multiple different routes so that if anyone followed them, they'd get lost. So to guide their way, they used the crystals to illuminate the path. But the only way that you could see that is if you completely put out the, the light and you're in the, in the darkness. And I think it, it said something along the lines of like, um, love is brightest in the darkness, which in the original is supposed to mean put the fire out so that you can see the crystals to guide your way and then you'll be together use love you know to be together that sort of thing but no in the in the uh, live action they just kind of made it like about family and brother and sister love and i just didn't really it didn't work for me it didn't work for me but I understand why they had to have Sokka and Katara. Because Ang was busy. Ang was too busy. Being detained. <laughs> so, yeah. Because he, he got, like, kidnapped sort of thing. Like, and he got to have a little heart-to-heart with Ira. Which I did like. I thought that that was, that was a nice little moment. Nice little moment. Um... Something else that was different in the live action that we did not see at all in the animation is Ang gets his hands on Zuko's diary. The drama. But it, it's not just any diary. It's like this diary about all the past avatars. So it's all the info that Ang needs. Because Ang wasn't really taught how to be the avatar. He was supposed to be sent away, wasn't he? So... He never really got any information on the Avatar, how to be the Avatar, who his past lives were. So this diary fills in all those details. And you know what? I enjoyed this detail because it fills in so much that we needed. Like, it helps guide Ang a bit more. And I feel like, yeah, that works. So I agree with that. I feel like that was that was a good add-in, really. I liked that. Him. And it was so funny when Zuko was really mad at him and was like, You stole my diary! <laughs> and Ang was like, Thank you, yes, it was so helpful. Oh, he's so funny. Um, and I really enjoyed the, uh, the Blue Spirits as well. I thought that they did an exceptional job of bringing the Blue Spirit to life and that reveal of, oh, It's Zuko! Now, obviously... I already know that because I watched the original. But when I was a kid watching it, I remember being really shocked. Was anyone else or did everyone already work it out? Because I was like, who is this guy? Who's the blue spirit? But nah, um, it seemed like a lot of people did know that it was Zuko. I I remember thinking as a kid, could it be Zuko? No, I was like, no, Zuko would never save the Avatar. But then like, as I grew up, it makes sense that he would want to save the Avatar because he needed to be the one to capture the Avatar to regain his honour. So, yeah, it made more sense when I grew up. But I did not expect that when I was watching it as a child. But let me know, like, did you guys see that one coming? Maybe it was just me. <laughs> So while they were, like, there was a part when um, they went into the spirit world. Now this, um, I've got mixed feelings on it. I do have mixed feelings. Because I enjoyed when they were going to the spirit world very much um, in the animation. But I feel like the live action didn't quite do it justice. 
it wasn't as interesting. It was more just spooky and scary. Which, yeah, that's fine. That's a vibe too. But, like, the spirit world was much more vibrant and interesting and crazy. And also, they did the same thing here. Which, it's for time. It's for pacing. I get it. This is a Netflix series. It can't be, like, three series long and have, like, 20 something episodes in it. It can't be. This is, I think it was, like, what, like, was it eight episodes or six or something like that, wasn't it? I have watched it, I promise. It was just, I've watched it a while ago and I've been watching other stuff since. I'm going to check on my phone now how many episodes. I feel like it was six. Um, Let's see, Avatar. So I, I do feel like for the pacing and all that, obviously they've got to merge storylines. They've got to be able to cut things out or change things. It was eight episodes. Um, so to be able to fit into those eight episodes, things are going to have to change. I get that. And for the most part, I do think they've done a good job. It's just a bit disappointing when some of your favourite things aren't included. Because they mean a lot, especially when it's a nostalgic show. I watched this as a kid. I grew up like consuming this every day after school it was all everyone talked about in school so then being an adult and watching it and i did watch i rewatched this during covid times the animation it's like you know half the population did it became really big on netflix during covid when they were able to acquire it and put it on there everyone watched it for the nostalgia factor and I get why, like, I loved it, I watched it, and then I watched Cora right after it, um, but getting back to what I'm saying about the spirit world, like, things do need to be cut and merged, but I feel like they did this a bit, a bit, it was rushed, it, it just felt wrong, the pacing felt off, and I just didn't fully agree with it, because they merged different storylines from different times when they went into the spirit world from the animation because in the animation there's different times where they go to different places and then they've gone into the spirit world in these separate locations and met certain characters like the owl or the fox and then there was like an appearance from Katara's mum and people got separated and all that but they were all on different occasions and it wasn't where they are now. And there was also a moment when, before Ang gets kidnapped and has to be saved by the Blue Spirit, aka Zuko, um, Katara and Sokka actually become really ill and Ang has to go and look for medicine. And it was during that that he runs into some trouble and gets kidnapped and has to get saved and all that. Um, and I could tell they were merging that kind of storyline but using the spirit world instead of them becoming ill because they needed to be able to separate the gang. They needed to be able to separate Ang, Katara and Sokka but have Katara and Sokka still be near each other because that's what happened when they got ill. So they needed that same scenario but not them getting ill. Um, they needed to use the spirit world as well so I could tell I could just see through it that like you're doing this for convenience sake and you're merging storylines and it doesn't quite fit here so we ended up seeing um, an owl in the spirit world I've forgotten the name of the owl but he's a very you know wise person and it's one that we actually don't meet until much later on in the original series. So this was quite a shock. This was like, whoa, what's this guy doing here? Why why have we got the big owl guy in season one? <laughs> like, what's going on? Um, so that took me out of it for a minute. It took me by surprise because we don't meet him until they're in a library underground in a desert. And then they have to, like bargain with him and exchange knowledge for their time to be able to look around the library you have to exchange knowledge to get knowledge or something like that but instead this owl 
He's not the protector of the library or anything like that, which I thought was a great storyline um, and definitely worth doing. But hey, um, instead of that, um, you know, it was just kind of like thrown in there and I didn't really see why. It's like you could have just used a made up spirit monster or spirit animal or something. Why use the owl? And that's what's making me think. Are they not going to do that storyline where they go and find that library? Because that is actually incredibly important. Because it leads them to find out about the comet. But I have also read some rumours that it seems like they're actually not going to stick to the comet storyline. Or at least not stick to it as much as they did in the original. They may use it but they don't want the characters to have an exact date of when that comet is going to come round again mainly because animation and live action and translating that on screen is very different in real life actors are going to age um with how long production takes you might be in like episode one and ang's like 12 and then when you get to like episodes like you know season three episode five next minute ang's a grown adult and only three weeks will have supposedly have passed you know how's that work that's weird that takes you out of it that's confusing so because they don't want to go with the same timeline as the show used what if it being like a few months or something they want to do this in their own timeline so they need to take away the ticking clock which was the comet understandably but I still think they should use the storyline of the library because it was really interesting. And I think that they could use it in a slightly different way. They could use it to find out that there's going to be a comet and that it will come round again, but we don't know when. You know, they could find that out. But I, I just found that to be a really interesting storyline. And that's where they came across the fox as well, which I think is supposed to be the Japanese um, mythological creature called a kitsune. I think that's how you say it. If I butcher any words during this podcast, by the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, it's very influenced by Asian culture. There's going to be a lot of words that I don't know. So if I butcher any of that, my apologies, but I'm trying my best. Um, especially when it comes to when I talk about casting later, I will probably butcher some names so be aware of that i i don't do it on purpose um see i wasn't really happy with the spirit world um we met some characters that aren't even a part of this storyline at all yes they're in the spirit world but they're not there in the spirit world the spirit world it's still a world they still have to travel you know like not that we're not aware of like a different transportation or teleportation in the spirit world we've not been told that so all we can assume is that wherever you are if you go into the spirit world you're you're still in that location it all still looks the same you're just in the spirit world and it, it has like a bit of a different vibe to it it looks slightly different like different colors but you're still there so then the spirits that live there are the ones that are there, if that makes sense. Like, it just seemed really weird because people who have seen the animation will know. Oh, that owl and that fox, they're supposed to be in a library underground in the desert. Why are they here? What have, what's made them come here? Do you know what I mean? So, instead of confusing the original fans and making them question why are they here, and are you using those characters now because you maybe don't plan on using them later? So instead of doing that, just make up a different spirit monster thing. Just just make one up. They can look like literally anything. That's kind of the point. They can look scary. They can look nice. They can look cute. They can look funny. Whatever. But anyway, moving on. So... I've read some notes, so I'm just reading through these notes. Um, yeah, I, I did understand why they, they did all that, but still, like, it just didn't feel 
quite right. Um, oh, and yes, speaking about that fox, the kitsune, turns out to be Yue. Which, again, it merges from different storylines for pacing's sake, but it didn't make any sense as to why she would be a fox. She, it, they try to explain it away by being like, Ooh, it's spirit magic. Because I'm infused with spirit, spirit magic, I can become... I can go into the spirit world. It just didn't fully make sense, and it was only explained a little bit, and it didn't feel like there was even a need for it. It was pointless. So I, I didn't appreciate that. It was just odd. But anyway. The live action also includes this brand new flashback which I loved. I thought, you know what, the animation could have done with this. So it was a flashback to Zuko comforting Iroh at his son's funeral. His son, I believe he's called Lu Ten. He died in the Battle of Bossing Sei. Um, and oh, original Avatar fans will know. <sighs> Leaves of the Vine. Such an emotional song. Oh my goodness. Um, but that was actually playing ever so slightly, like a rendition of that in the background of that scene. Oh, my heart breaks. Um, but yeah, I feel like we needed to see that kind of scene where... Zuko and Iroh, they're grieving at the funeral. It really helps to, it helps to humanise these characters. And we don't get to see that a lot in the original, which I feel like that's where the original could be improved, is more humanisation of the bad guys. Because even the bad guys, for the most part, some of them might not even realise that they're doing something wrong. Or they might not fully even accept that they're the bad guy. And we need to see that part. We need to have an understanding and see their perspective to actually, you know, understand it. And I feel like th this live action does that very well. So I do appreciate that side of things. And the live action also shows what actually happened during Zuko and Fire Lord Ozai's Agni Kai. Now, Fire Lord Ozai is Zuko's dad. Um, although he's not really someone who's going to be winning Father of the Year anytime soon. Because during the Agni Kai, which is kind of like the ultimate firebending match. You know, it's something that's only done in severe circumstances when you challenge someone to a fight. And usually, I think it's to the death. Or at least until your opponent, like, gives up. So... Yeah, we actually saw what happened there. And in this version, Zuko fights back. He doesn't want to, but he does fight back. We didn't fully get to see, like, kind of what happened. It was more just implied. Um, so that was that was really interesting to see. Again, it helped humanise Zuko more. We got to see how he got that scar officially. And it was really interesting to see that it was actually in front of everyone including his sister Azula and I thought that her intro has been quite interesting and I have mixed feelings on that because I really enjoyed and probably favour the animation um, like that version of her intro because I enjoyed the mysteriousness around her and not knowing who she is and what she's like until we get to see her interact with people but it was interesting to see this different perspective on her in the Fire Nation and how she interacts with her people, which isn't very nice. And how what her relationship is like with her dad, which for me, the original Azula would not have been as approval seeking as this Azula is. But maybe that's just something that we didn't see in the original. I feel like she was... The live action Azula was really trying to seek her father's approval. And that is what meant the most to her. Whereas the Azula in the original didn't care what anyone thought. She wanted to show her father that she could do 
all these things and that she's better than Zuko. But her main driving force was power and showing everyone that she deserves to be the rightful heir to the, to the throne, not Zuko. So it wasn't really about approval, it was about power. That's where I feel like the motivation differs. And I'm not quite sure which one is better. Maybe I, I'm just too loyal to the animation, but I'm leaning more towards that for like Azula's introduction and motivation. Um, and we also finally get to see June, which, oh, I was waiting for this. I really like June. <laughs> I know I shouldn't, because like, she's kind of like a bit of a bad guy, but at the same time, she's so cool. She's just, she oozes coolness. And I love that. Um, but yeah, she's not, not really on anyone's side. You know, she's neutral, but at the same time, if you have got the money to pay her to be a bounty hunter and go kidnap someone, she's loyal to you then. So her loyalty can be bought. And like, I respect that though. Because she's always like said she's not like on anyone's side. It's just about being a bounty hunter. So I get it. I get it, June. <laughs> She's loyal to the coin. I get it. Um, but yeah, I thought the cast on for June was perfection. It was amazing. Everything. And then the CGI as well of um, her animal. Oh, was it Nala? Nyla? Nyla or Nala? Um, perfect as well. The, no notes no notes on june she's amazing and yeah the kidnapping of ang is a bit different but it still holds very true to the actual storyline and doesn't really change anything overall so no notes the scene at the water tribe um the northern water tribe at the spirit oasis that's a bit different as well because ang was actually in there and he did go into the spirit world in there because that's one of the most spiritual places so that was a bit different. And Zuko actually like confronts Katara in the Spirit Oasis in the original, and tries to kidnap Aang, and it's like a whole thing. Um, and then they have like a heart to heart and all that. And it's, I prefer that. But hey, it wasn't overall too different. It didn't make me really like annoyed. So I was okay with it. I'll I'll let it go. It's okay. But yeah, um. UA's sacrifice and all that, that was, again, heartbreaking. Oh, soccer. His first girlfriend had to go be the moon. So sad. Um, but they kept the storyline, all there, very, very, very similar. Very true to the original source, which was great. And the whole thing with the moon and ocean spirits and, and um, Zhao trying to, you know, he actually does kill the moon spirit and... Yeah, they did a great job of showing that and bringing that scene to life. And it was intense and dark. And yeah, I, I enjoyed seeing that being brought to life. Because I remember watching it as a kid and thinking, oh my god, no, it's over for them. This is it. He's took away the source of their bending. This is it. And then, oh, Ang. Yeah, oh, Ang saves the day. Of course he does. But... Um, it is obviously a massive battle that they go through. But one thing that I really enjoyed is seeing them bring to life the big, like, ocean spirit monster that Ang becomes. They did a great job of that. And of, I mean, it was virtually shot for shot in many of these scenes, but particularly the end battle. They really tried to keep the shots the same. And that, that was done brilliantly. And I kind of... I didn't mind the scene where we see Momo get hit to then showcase Yue's healing powers. I didn't mind it, but at the same time, I just felt like it was a bit pointless. It was a bit useless. Like, there wasn't really much point in showing it. We'd already heard about Yue and that, like, she was, um, she's been infused with the magic because she was ill as a child and that's what's healed her. And then because she has that magic, she can give it back. And that's why she has to go be the moon because the moon spirit's dead. So then she's the moon. Yeah, it's a whole thing. But yeah, um, overall, the end battle there, I feel like they did that very well. A few differences, 
but it remains the same and the result is the exact same. It just relies a bit more heavily on the sacrifice from Yue and Ang's sacrifice as well because it seems like he was going to sacrifice himself to the spirit world but because of Yue's sacrifice that wasn't that didn't have to be in the end and he was able to come back out of the avatar state come back from the spirit world and into his own body and become himself again and Katara really grounds him and um yeah yeah I, d- I did enjoy that last battle I felt like it was very epic so moving on to what I think they got wrong okay get the tea people I'm just gonna have a sip of my drink before we begin I encourage you to have a sip of yours so what they got wrong and this was really important is that Ang didn't learn water bending in season one what he's doing He's the avatar. The point of like going to the Northern Wars tribe and all that and being the avatar is to learn the elements. Yes, you're 12 and you've been frozen in ice though for like 100 years. So technically you're 112. Get your arse into gear, Ang. Come on. <laughs> you need to learn how to water bend and you run in to a waterbender, Katara. Yes, she's not amazing, but she knows some stuff. She knows some stuff. She does get better, but, you know, she she has potential. Why are you not learning how to waterbend while you're on your way to different places, like the water tribe, you know, the, the northern water tribe, when you're, like, in a moshu and all that? Why are you not learning to waterbend? What are you doing in your downtime? What are you doing, Ang? It was so important in season one in the original that Ang would learn how to waterbend from Katara. And there was actually a very important moment where Katara was teaching him and she wasn't the best at it at the beginning. She's still learning because in her tribe, waterbending was banned really because the Fire Nation were obliterating all waterbenders. So any sign of a waterbender and she'd be dead. So the actor does not waterbend she'd witnessed her mum be murdered because her mum said that she was the waterbender that the fire nation were looking for and she wasn't katara was so you know she feels guilty about that obviously but not her fault so we know katara hasn't really had a lot of practice but she has the ability so she can try and teach him but yeah in the original um, Katara gets mad at Ang because Ang picks up waterbending so fast. He's like a natural because it's really similar to air and he is an airbender. So he picks that up, no problem. And he's actually a little bit better at it than here in the beginning. And she gets like super angry at him. And in that moment to me, that like really shows Katara's personality more. She can be jealous. She can be mad. Because so far, all we've seen is this really kind, lovely Katara who wants to help save the world. But then she has flaws. Like, she can be mad. That's what I loved about the original is it really explored Katara's personality. And that's why we're moving on to why the hell doesn't Katara have a personality in the live action? What happened to it? What happened to it? Did they just forget to write it in? It's so bland. This is not having a go at the actress. Right. She did a great job at what she had. I think it's the writing. Right. I'm not great at her name. Because I, I am awful at pronunciations. Um, But the actress... Kiwayentento? Again, I know I'm butchering it. I know I am. I'm so sorry. But anyway, this actress, Google her. If you Google Avatar The Last Airbender Netflix cast, she'll come up. I think she did a great job at what she's got. But the personality was not developed enough in this live action version. Because Katara is a very 
versatile character. She's the mum of the group. She looks after everyone. She's always caring for everyone. She's kind. She's so hopeful. She's generous. She's always wanting to help people and look after people. But at the same time, she knows how to have fun as well. Like we see in season two, she like knows how to like cut loose and have some fun and be a kid. But she's also got those flaws. She can be mad. She can be jealous. She can do bad things when she thinks it's the right thing to do. Like stealing a water water scroll. Which leads me to another point as well. Like the way Katara learns how to bend is different in the live action. In the original she steals a water scroll and then learns how to bend from that. But she steals it from pirates which you know bites them in the bum further down the line because they come after them. And she has to like confess to the group that she stole it. And obviously Sokka and Aang are like, but you keep telling us not to steal stuff. And like, you know, it shows she's got flaws. And I just thought that was amazing character development. But hey, you know, not an expert, but I just think they should have developed their personality more. Instead, we see that Katara gets the scroll from her grandma, which I do like. But... We then just don't get those little bits of her personality when it's forced out in those situations. Like she was forced to steal from pirates to be able to learn waterbending. But anyway. Of course, something that they did massively wrong was not including Sokka's sexism. And then later, in the Northern Water Tribe though, they do show sexism. They show that um, Master... Paku, I think his name is Paku. It was Paku, right? Um, he is very sexist. And yet, they were fine showing that. So, like, what's going on, Netflix? Who who decided that you can not, like, let's not show sexism with soccer, but show it with Master Paku? What was the reasoning? I need to know. Because you massively missed out on soccer's character development there. And I just feel like that was wrong. And then you didn't give Suki as well the platform to be able to say that, like, you know, you can be a female and be a warrior. Like, you can be both. You can be both. But anyway. um, They didn't, didn't really explore Jet and his crew. That could have been done in more depth. And I feel like there was no real reason why they couldn't have done that in more depth, to be fair. Um... No Jong Jong? There was no Jong Jong. Mm, no, just not even mentioned when he was like really important in Aang's firebending journey. Um, no mention of Jong Jong, which was disappointing. He was a good character, but nope. Um, it should have been Aang and Katara in the tunnels, like I said earlier, because it does foreshadow their future relationship and it just overall makes way more sense. Also, Overall in the show, the humour just wasn't quite hitting. Like, it didn't... It wasn't the same as the original. And some really funny jokes just weren't even included. Like, this probably won't even sound funny. But in the original, it's so funny. But in the first instant where Aang meets Katara in soccer, Aang says, like, have you seen my flying bison? And then eventually he's like, Hi, this is Appa, my flying bison. And then Sokka, sarcastically, with that quick wit, just goes to Ang. Hi, this is my sister, Katara. Oh, no, sorry. Hi, this is my flying sister, Katara. Sorry, I butchered that joke there. But yeah, he just flips it on him and is like, This is my flying sister, Katara. And honestly, his deadpan approach to that joke was so funny. I remember laughing as that both as a kid and as a child, that wasn't even included, that joke, and it was so funny, it would have been a hit. I know it would have. I know it would have, but no. So yeah, just some humour, some pieces of like humour and, and the jokes didn't quite hit, but I've got to say, the actor who plays soccer, I believe he actually suggested some jokes to use, and the ones that he did use in there a lot of them from him were very funny 
and matched the character perfectly so did a good job still but i think we could have included more from the original overall many of the storylines felt very rushed and it didn't take the little detours like the original to explore other important storylines along the way and develop those characters more i would have liked to see that but i understand it was eight episodes they had a lot to to fit in but it, it could have been done better i think maybe they could have expanded it to 10 episodes to fully flesh out more of those details and develop the characters i mean i would have loved 12 episodes or more but i feel like 10 would have been the right amount really to give us a bit more of what we wanted so last but not least what did they get right well all of the different elements and cultures that were involved i feel like they did perfectly we got to see many different types of cultures from going to the different water tribes and um Omoshu and Kyoshi Islands. We explored quite a bit in the first season. Of course, in the original, many of this wasn't done until season two, but they've brought it forward for the pacing and it still worked quite quite well. Um but many of the elements as well I really liked. I thought they did the CGI of the actual bending of different elements perfectly it looked just like the animation so i was very happy with that one thing that i was concerned about was how are they going to do like the fire because especially when they do the fire kicks is it going to look realistic and it did it actually did i was really pleased with the visual effects not just with the elements but overall the visuals in this they did so right the beautiful sunrises the different landscapes of the earth kingdom the water tribe all that even seeing the fire nation and everything i just think they did the visuals like they were spot on just like in the animation or better i feel like they did the asian representation very well much better than a certain film that we won't mention <clears throat> because we are, we are all trying to pretend it doesn't exist um this one actually has asian representation which you know matters very much so especially when this is an asian show <laughs> like you kind of need asian representation but yeah um i thought that they did that really well and they showed how diverse many different asian cultures can be as well and then of course disability representation now we haven't got to tough not yet because that's in season two and obviously she's got to be in it surely surely they're not going to cut her out because i hope not if they do i'll be livid but um she's such a massive part and she's blind so the original did a great job of showcasing this bill's representation in season two but we haven't got to that yet so we can't say but what we can say so far about the disability representation is that we've seen that um, when they got to Amoshu in the live action um, with the merged storylines of the mechanist and his son. Now his son doesn't have the use of his legs. So his dad built him kind of like a makeshift wheelchair but it can also fly. So they kind of act like they're airbenders a lot of the time and they do fly. Ang actually mistakes them for airbenders and he's really upset when he realises that, that, that they're not because he's the only one who's left. So, like, it is devastating. But he understands and he gets over it after a bit. <laughs> but, yeah, I enjoyed that representation showing that even though these people are disabled, they still bring a lot of worth to the storyline, a lot of value. They can fight and they're able to actually contribute to this storyline and push it forward which they did because this character um i've forgotten his name now i will actually try and look this up um but the mechanist mechanist's son he actually um is making weapons for the fire nation 
which you know not great that's that's not fun but he had to do it because he needed to make money for his family and it was also for safety to not be killed you know so not great but his son's name is Tio I think he's 13 year old disabled boy who Ang says has the spirit of an airbender and he truly does he does he's a very free-spirited young boy um, and he actually um, helps contribute to the storyline by talking about the um, blasting jelly which is a weapon that was developed by the mechanist and they help foil the plan of Jet and save everyone so it just shows there's a lot of representation there and they're doing it very very well something else that they do incredibly well is strong female characters we love to see it we've got Katara we've got Suki and throughout the series like you can see different strong characters and Kiyoshi oh Kiyoshi we love Kiyoshi that was something else that I felt like they did very very well is showcasing um, Kiyoshi and her power when she possesses Aang's body which came out of nowhere really because that doesn't happen in the um in the original not like that like we we get to see her but not like that so she fully possesses and then she just like obliterates the fire nation and it, oh it's so cool it's amazing we love her uh, she chooses violence every time but we love her so yeah i appreciate the strong female characters within the show and i feel like it's a great message especially for a younger generation and younger viewers when i grew up watching this i loved seeing katara toff and suki they were all my favorites so you know we need that representation and speaking of strong female characters one thing that and I saved this for this bit, not for an earlier bit, because I really wanted to talk about it. This is something that is completely different from the original. And that I think is a million times better than what was in the original. So Katara and the women from the Northern Water Tribe all come together to stand for equality. And this was a moment that I thought was very impactful. It actually made me feel like emotional watching it i almost like cried watching it i was like whoa this is powerful because when she gets to the northern water tribe she's unaware that they're a lot stricter about the rules of women fighting and all that than in the southern they were still you know they didn't really want women fighting but there was only women left so they had no choice but um in the northern tribe They don't let women do anything other than heal. That's all they can do with their water bending powers is heal and not fight. But Katara, she does both. She does both. So she asks the women, do you want to fight? Like, we don't really see that, but it's implied that she asks them, do you want to fight? And she comes back to Master Paku, who was sexist and refused to teach her and just kept saying no that's not how it's done this is how it is here we don't teach women how to fight go go to the healing huts with the other women that's where you belong and she does fight him to show off her talent and he does say to her even though he beats her because he is a master but he beats her and then he says to her you are an exceptional waterbender you have skill and she says um something along the lines of yeah but you still won't teach me will you and obviously he says no because he's sexist and then um yeah she just gets all the women together to show him look it's not just me all these women want to fight as well and you need the help because the fire nation are about to come in and blow this place apart so you know we're gonna we need to help you're desperate you need all the help you can get and it's in that moment where he realises, yeah, actually, yeah, we do need your help. So it forces them into being able to fight. And he does eventually respect her for what she can do. And I feel like that's a lot better than the original. Because in the original, he does agree to teach her. But only because he realises that she's 
the granddaughter of his previously betrothed. And it's just like, oh, you're so-and-so's granddaughter. Oh, I was going to marry her. Oh, okay, I'll teach you. So it was not it was not to do with skill in the end. <laughs> so, yeah, the live action did that better. And I loved it. And I, re- I will probably rewatch that episode just for Katara's feminist movement there. Love that. Um, I felt like a lot of the casting was spot on. Particularly Ang, Sokka, Zuko and Iroh. The only thing that I would give notes on you know obviously as an expert in acting I'm kidding I'm not I, I do not act but I am a, a avid consumer of content especially tv shows and I did study film and you know I feel like I, I've got some qualification to talk about this but the only thing that I would change in regards to Ang would be that I'd want to see more of the fun loving Ang that we did see in the original. We get a more serious Ang, which I'm not mad at, but I just would have liked to see a bit more balance with the fun loving Ang. And then for Iroh, I really do appreciate the actor who plays him. I feel like he's doing a great job. Um and the actor is Paul Sun Hyung Lee. He was in Mr. Kim, and I really like the actor. I think he's great, and he's he's a great fit for this. I just would have liked a bit more zenness in the tone of his voice. I feel like he can he can. There's some moments where he's really really zen, but then he just kind of like talks normally and all that. Maybe the actor is given a different approach, like a different take on the character. But we all know Iroh to be this zen tea loving sloth like character who would rather pour another another cup of jasmine tea than plot out a war like he is so zen he can sometimes sound as if he's high but he's not he's just high off of tea it's a tea high and i feel like that could have been added in more we could have had more of that zenness but other than that Ian Ousley who plays soccer was the absolute perfect epitome of the best possible casting choice no notes no notes amazing he's great he even kind of looks like soccer which is impressive in itself like well done to him um Gordon can't Cormier, Cormier, Cormier. He plays Ang, and I do feel like he does a great job. Really great. Like he, he does capture the soul of Ang, and I think that that's kind of hard to do. So I, I did enjoy his performance. Um. Oh, Zuko, Dallas, James, Lee, Liu. Um. Again, if I'm butchering names, my apologies. I'm trying not to. But yeah, I felt like his performance of Zuko really captured how Zuko is very torn. And he has that inside of him constantly. He wants to do good, but he also wants to regain his honour. He wants his father's approval. He's constantly seeking that approval. He just wants to be accepted. And he wants to have somewhere where he feels like it's home. And like he's safe. He wants his people. And... He's not going to get that from his father, but he doesn't realise that. He doesn't realise that. And what we're going to see, hopefully, if they get a season two, is a massive character arc for him. And I can't wait, because the animation did that just incredibly. It was incredible to watch that and to go from hating him to loving him. So I can't wait for that in the original. Sorry, in the live action. (laughs) Um, something that I thought like was really really good and again wasn't actually in the original was Zuko's fleet backstory so we actually got to learn that when Zuko was banished um, for after he questioned his father's tactic for war and about like he was going to be sacrificing lots of innocent people and Fire Nation army 
um there was a certain part of that army that he was willing to sacrifice and Zuko was like no that's not good don't do that um because you know he's a good person so then the fire lord decides to challenge him to the Agni Kai and then he banishes him so after that we get to hear that Ozai actually says to Zuko well since you wanted to save this fleet so much why don't you take them and go and find the avatar so instead of that fleet being sacrificed in the tactics that Ozai had they were saved and they were sent away with Zuko and that fleet does actually learn that story from Iroh and they become very grateful to Zuko then because they didn't really like him I mean, couldn't really blame them because he was a bit of an arsehole to them. <laughs> but it's because he was hurt and cast out and he needed to regain his honour. So, you know, I get it. But yeah, he wasn't he wasn't a nice person back then. Um, I thought they did Azula's intro quite well. Do have mixed feelings, but ultimately it still works. And we get to see a bit more about her character developed earlier on. So, I'm not entirely sure if it's the best way to go about it, but it works. Merging some of those storylines, like I said earlier, it, some work, some don't. But overall, I think it has improved some parts of the show. And that is hard to do. And I really loved the exploration of Kiyoshi and her power. I feel like that was a really interesting part there. Another thing that I felt like it isn't talked about, but it is covertly shown. The concept of found families. It's something that we see in the animation over time. But I feel like in the live action, we've got to explore it a bit sooner. We've seen Sokka and Katara and Aang come together and see that they can be a family together. They are all safe with each other. They can look out for each other. And they do become like a family in this short span of time. And then especially with Zuko and Iroh, they are a found family just in themselves even the fleet to an extent after they learn what Zuko did for them they become like a family you know the, and Zuko we know from the original Zuko goes on to realize that he doesn't need his father's approval and he can become a better person and he doesn't need to go back and regain his honor and he becomes a part of the gang he does eventually go on to to teach Ang how to firebend and they ultimately become a found family in themselves and I think that's really important um, and they change the rules with the comet which I talked about a little bit earlier and I do feel like this is going to fit better with the live action we're not going to have that ticking clock and then the realism of, of production and how things change and people grow older and the filming takes ages like it just wouldn't work so I do agree with that and of course secret tunnels they did, did that so right oh and the lesbian lovers and it was a good homage to the original it didn't do it all it didn't show you know the full song and like all the other songs but it was enough to satisfy the need for that song and then of course to end this cabbages we got the cabbage man oh my goodness and it's the original guy the original voice of the cabbage man came back reprised his role and said the iconic iconic phrase oh no my cabbages oh my god he, honestly you know what he's the best character i think he's the best character he really is he shows up everywhere i love it and we even got to see like the little bits like entering omoshu they wouldn't let him in and then they like earth bended his cabbages off <laughs> and over into like the abyss and that's exactly what happened in the original 
So, like, that was fun to see. And um, every time Anger's fighting someone, it's like the Cabbage Man just follows them everywhere, but accidentally he doesn't mean to go where they go. But he's just everywhere that they are. So then when Ang is fighting firebenders, he accidentally gets in the middle of it all. And then his cabbages are just destroyed. And it's the best long running joke in the series. And I can't wait to see more of them. Bring on the cabbages. Well, that was my in-depth review of Avatar The Last Airbender live action. And overall, I feel like they did a pre- pretty decent job of bringing it to life. They can't bring everything to life. It's not doable. But they did a good job with what they could work with, with what was possible. I would have liked to see maybe a few more episodes, maybe 10 episodes in total. But other than that, yeah, I think they did, they did a good job. I just wish they would have brought the sexism back into it with soccer and you know, some other little bits that would have really developed characters more and, and they should have just gave Katara a personality. Oh, that that let things down. But overall, for me, I'm going to give that four out of five stars. I've, I'm taking away that five star because they needed to develop soccer with sexism more. That was a vital part of his character. Katara had no personality and then they could have done some some things a bit differently and a bit better. But yeah, four stars. I'm happy with that. I think it was really enjoyable. And it's one that I'll watch again. And I think the way that they've done it, it works perfectly. Whether you come into the fandom as someone who watched this as a child. Or whether you're brand new to it, you've never seen of it and you've never even heard of it. It explains everything at the beginning. Like it really builds the world. Sometimes my only other critique would be sometimes it does do a lot of of telling instead of showing. Which could be better. But still. It's a very decent adaptation. And it will be an ad- adaptation. It will be a remix. It's not going to be an exact repl- replica. Because it can't be. So, yeah, I did enjoy it. It's entertaining and I'd watch it again. So, thank you so much for listening. I hope you've all really enjoyed listening to me ramble on about my review of Avatar The Last Airbender live action. Um, It's something that I've been looking forward to and I'm, I'm glad that I could, I could get to review it finally. Let me know in the comments what you thought of it. What did you think they did right and what they did wrong? And what would you like to see better in other seasons if they do get more seasons? If they do get reviewed, which I hope they do. I want to see Toph. I want to at least see Toph, so I hope they do get renewed. Um, But yeah, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe on whichever platform you're listening on. And leave some feedback. You can rate us on spotify and i think on amazon music and maybe google podcasts i'm not too sure but yeah rate us and make sure to click the notifications as well so that you get notified every time there's a brand new episode so that you don't miss anything so i hope you guys really did enjoy this if you did let us know let us know on our socials We are Cozy Corner Pod, I believe, on all socials. So have a little look. Go follow us there if you're not already. And stay cozy. Mm